In this video, I'm going to tell you about the top 10 players, in my opinion, that are most likely to be voted into the Baseball Hall of Fame through the Classic Era Committee. Stick with me, and I'll tell you all about it. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me on my channel Brutus on Baseball once again. This video is going to be about the Classic Era Committee and the Baseball Hall of Fame and who I think the top 10 players are that are most likely to get in through that committee. The Baseball Hall of Fame has been changing the makeup of the Eras Committee for years now. Every couple of years, they come up with a new iteration, usually based on whether nobody is getting voted in or too many guys are getting voted in. In recent years, I think it's been too many guys. We've seen guys like Harold Baines and Jim Catt and Gil Hodges that really don't have the career accolades that they should to be able to get it in. And yet these guys have been voted in by a small group of their peers and writers. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been some great guys that have been voted in recently. Guys like Manny Mignoso and Alan Trammell are two examples of guys that should have been in long ago, in my opinion. And we need the era committees to be able to rectify that. But we've seen another change this past year. The Hall of Fame has changed the Eras Committee into two committees. The Classic Era, which covers anybody that played prior to 1980, and then the Contemporary Era, anybody that played most of their career after 1980. There are some guys that straddle that, but I tried to put them into whatever bucket seemed most appropriate for their career. The one thing I'll say about the Classic Era Committee is that it has been picked clean. We've seen a lot of guys voted in the last few years, so there's not a whole lot left here. A couple guys at the top, but then the rest of my top 10 is filled in with guys that may not make it and maybe shouldn't make it. But there are some gems here still that we should be paying attention to. The first player up on my classic era committee list is Dick Allen. This is a guy who should have been in in 2015 and 2022 when he got 11 of 12 votes each time. He had a much better career than some of the guys who did get voted in. My prediction is that he should be the next one voted in through this era committee when it meets again in 2025. I put the percent certainty at 75%. Not very certain, but certain enough that I think he should be able to get in. But I did think that before as well. His career WAA and war was 33 and 59. He did have a bit of a shorter career and he was more of a first baseman DH type guy, even though he did spend some time at third base as well. His career accolades, seven time all-star, rookie of the year in 1964. He was an MVP and then finished into the top five MVP in another year. Eight gold gloves, one silver slugger, 156 OPS plus. And he was really one of the most feared hitters of his generation and had a really high peak in a short number of years. Why has he missed out so far? He had a short career. He has low hit and home run totals overall, and he was disliked by fans and journalists at the time. We have to think about the context here. He played at the height of his career in the late 60s and early 70s, which was right at the time of the civil rights movement as well. There was a lot of harsh feelings during that time, and he wasn't treated very respectfully in a lot of ways. He was a very strong black man who knew what was important to him, and he didn't roll over for just everybody. So he was seen by fans and journalists as not very likable, which in my opinion was no fault of his own. His teammates, on the other hand, thought he was a great teammate, and I think that's something that we should pay way more attention to. Number two on my list, Louis Tiant. Tiant pitched mostly for the Red Sox, and he hasn't been given a lot of love by the previous era committees, but his highest vote percentage was around 31% in 1988. My prediction, he's the next most likely to get in, and the next time the era committee meets is 2028. My certainty is around 40%, so not very certain going forward. The era committees haven't been very consistent historically on whether they vote too few guys in or too many, so anything could really happen here. His career WAA and war numbers are 34 and 65, still pretty decent. Three-time All-Star, one-time top five MVP finisher, MVP for a pitcher, and two-time Cy Young top five finisher. 229 career wins, which was seen as really low when compared to previous pitchers. But in today's context, when wins are paid a lot less attention to, maybe that'll change. Why has he missed so far? He missed a lot of those major milestones. Not enough wins, not enough strikeouts. And his 114 ERA plus is good, but not great. He was really a dominant pitcher for a few years with a lot of more average or a slightly above average years surrounding it. I think he'll be in someday, but it may take a little while. Number three player on my list is Thurman Munson, catcher for the New York Yankees. My prediction, maybe 2031 is when he'll get in, but now we're getting so far in the future that the chances of the era committee staying the same are pretty low. I give him about a 30% chance of being elected in some form of the era committee in the future. His WAA and war numbers are pretty low, 25 and 46, but they're actually pretty good when you consider the context. 
He died early at the age of 32 in a plane crash. He was a seven-time All-Star, Rookie of the Year in 1970, and a one-time MVP, three-time Gold Glover at the catching position. And like I said, he has a short career. He was killed in that plane crash at 32 years old. But he was already declining by around that time. As a catcher at 32, maybe he wouldn't have had a whole lot of years left in him. We can only speculate at this point. I think there's a lot of nostalgia around Thurman Munson and the fact that he died early. So this could impact his candidacy one way or the other. Who knows? We'll see where it goes. Number four on my list is Bill Dolan. This is actually a guy that I think should have gotten in on the early baseball committee last time around. He's a leftover from a really great era in the late 1800s. His best chance of getting in is when he got 10 out of 13 votes in 2013 in one of the era committees. My prediction, maybe 2031 for him. 20% certainty, so not very certain here. We may lose Dolan to history at some point and kind of forget about him if he doesn't get in. His WAA was 39 and 75. He was a really good player of his time, and he was seen as that. He had almost 2,500 hits, a 110 OPS+. plus. He was known as a defensive wizard, which is what kind of elevates his war numbers a little bit. And if you ask me, looking back at the 1800s and calculating war is a bit tricky. So take it with a grain of salt. He did lead several offensive categories at the time of his retirement, showing that he was a really good player that early on in the days of baseball. So maybe that should mean something. But why is he missed so far? He has kind of been lost in history. All of those categories where he was leading at retirement, he definitely didn't lead for very long as better players came along. But he's been uplifted by war recently. Maybe we missed something here. And I think that it's worth a longer look as we begin to understand it a little bit better. Number five on my list is John Donaldson. Now, Donaldson's an interesting case. He was passed over when the Baseball Hall of Fame took a really deep look at the Negro Leagues. He got 8 out of 12 votes in 2006 and 2022, so not close enough. At this point, I'm going to stop predicting, because after 2031, I highly doubt that there's going to be a similar schedule as to what is shown now. I think it's about a 10% chance of him getting in. It really depends on how deeply the Hall of Fame wants to dive into the Negro Leagues once again. Now, the accolades are important here. The story is important because we don't have stats from his time period. He pitched in the pre-Negro League and into the Negro Leagues for 30 plus years. That's a long career. He's reported to have 400 plus wins, 5,000 plus strikeouts, and 14 no-hitters, which is double what Nolan Ryan had. And importantly, he helped to develop the barnstorming model, which is how black players in the pre-Negro League times were able to travel around the country and actually play against amateur competition and sometimes professional competition. This was an important model that started to establish black baseball in the early 1900s. Why is he missed? Because there's a whole lack of knowledge around stats in the pre-Negro Leagues and minimal understanding of his greatness. There was a lot of research done in the early 2000s when a lot of the Negro League players went in, but John Donaldson was missed, and it may still continue to be the case. Number six on my list is Home Run Johnson. A lot of what I just said about John Donaldson applies to Home Run Johnson. He hasn't had a lot of support in 2006, 2022, less than four votes. We don't actually know how many he got. And I peg his chances at about 10% as well. But his story is the same. We just don't know a whole lot about what happened with his career back in the late 1800s or very early 1900s. He was a longtime player and manager of pre nigger leagues. He was an exceptional hitter, and he's reported to have a 160 OPS plus compared to his peers. Again, he was a pre-Negro League player, and there's not a great understanding of his stats and the story of his playing career from that time. So he starts to get lost to history a little bit, unless we can find more information or start sharing his story a bit more. Number seven on my list is Ken Boyer. Boyer was a phenomenal third baseman for the Cardinals in the 50s and 60s. He's had some decent showings, including 9 out of 12 votes in the 2007 Veterans Committee. But I just don't know how he's going to be able to get in, and he didn't have a great showing in 2022. I give him about a 10% chance as well. His WAA and war numbers are 31 and 63, both really solid. He was an 11-time All-Star, 1-time MVP, 5-time Gold Glove winner, and a 1-time World Series champion. But he's got low career totals for overall hits, home runs, things like that. And he was really overshadowed during his playing career by guys like Eddie Matthews and Brooks Robinson. And it's hard to make it to the Hall of Fame if you're the third or fourth best player at your position during your time. Number eight on my list is Bobby Gritch. Bobby Gritch has not had much support, if any, from the Hall of Fame voting, peaking at 2.6% in 1992 and falling off the ballot. I have no idea when he's going to get in. He may never get in, and I wouldn't be surprised with that. 
I give him about a 5% chance of getting in. His WAA and war numbers show that we really should be looking again at this guy. And maybe as time goes by and we understand these numbers a bit more, his candidacy will get that boost that it needs. He had a WAA of 43, a war of 71. A lot of this is tied to just being consistently great for a lot of years on both sides of the baseball, offense and defense. He was a six-time All-Star, four-time Gold Glover, one-time Silver Slugger. Why has he missed so far? He's got low counting stats. And he was very underappreciated during his career, which never lends very well to having high vote totals from the Hall of Fame committees or the baseball writers themselves. The analytics have recently improved the understanding as overall value. So we'll see where that goes in coming years. Number nine on the list is Tommy John. Tommy John had a better turnout in the voting, up to almost 32% in 2009. I think he's got about a 10% chance of making it as well. But his WAA number is 21, showing that he wasn't really that great above an average player over the course of his career. He was just more consistently slightly above average, which is seen in his war number of 62, which is pretty good. He's a four-time All-Star. 288 wins, which fell short of 300, which was the standard for a long time. But as we look back, the win category may change our opinion a little bit. But maybe not with respect to Tommy John, because he did play on some pretty good teams. The key here, though, is that he was the first to undergo Tommy John surgery, which is where the name comes from, obviously. He was the first to rehab and make a comeback from it and have a complete second half of his career from it. And to me, with his 288 wins, the fact that he has a war of 62, which shows that he was very good for a long period of time, combined with being a trailblazer for Tommy John surgery, is enough for me when he put it all together. Why is he missed, though? He didn't get 300 wins, he was never very dominant, and he didn't get very many votes in the balloting for Cy Young year after year. To me, his candidacy lies solely on the fact that he was a very good pitcher, and will people give him a bit of extra credit for being the first for Tommy John surgery? And number 10 on my list is Reggie Smith. Reggie Smith is one of those guys that is almost completely forgotten, it seems. He only got 0.7% of the vote in 1988. I think his chances are very slim, maybe 5%. But again, that may rise as we start to understand the WA and war numbers. WA of 37, war of 65. Really great numbers showing that he was consistently a very good player in the league for a lot of years. He was a seven-time All-Star, two-time MVP top five finisher, and a gold glove. He has a high war total, and there's a lot more respect lately for his contributions as we look at war and understand war a little bit better. Why is he missed? He obviously missed the milestones. He has low career totals for hits and home runs, and he was underappreciated at the time as well. But maybe, once again, as we understand the analytics a little bit better, we'll understand the value that provided the game, and maybe that'll change our minds as well in Hall of Fame voting. Now, as in other videos, I've got a small list of honorable mentions, but this one's a little bit of a dishonorable mention. These are guys that have had a lot of popularity in the Hall of Fame vote in the past, but in my opinion, they shouldn't be on the list compared to the previous 10 guys that I mentioned. The first is Dave Parker. I think he's got about a 20% chance of actually being voted in the Hall of Fame. But his WAA number of 6.5 showed that for the entirety of his career, he was barely above average. And his war of 40 showed that he didn't even put it together for a very long time either. He was a seven-time All-Star, one-time MVP, four-time Top 5 MVP finisher, three-time Gold Glover, three-time Silver Slugger, and a two-time World Series champion. A lot of accolades there. But... If you ask me, a lot of those accolades probably were not deserved. He was just extremely popular and overvalued during the time when he played. Why did he miss? Low career totals, significant drop off in the 1980s, and a lot of drug use issues that have impacted his ability to play in the 1980s. Next up is Steve Garvey. Steve Garvey has had a lot of support and was seen as a surefire Hall of Famer during his career. It reflected in his 1995 highest vote total of almost 43% by the writers. I think he's got a 25% chance of making it in, and that's one of my worries too. This guy could be the next Harold Baines that probably shouldn't be in, but may get in because he has the support of whoever is on the air committee at the time. His WAA number is pretty similar to Dave Parker, 7, and his war number, 39, is even lower too. But he was a 10-time All-Star, an MVP, another top 5 MVP finish, 4 gold gloves, almost 2,600 hits, and a 117 OPS+. Really good player 
but just not that great compared to his peers. And a lot of it's because he was a first baseman and didn't have very good defense at first base either. Why has he missed? He missed too many milestones. He has low WA and war totals. He was overrated during his career, and he shouldn't have won the MVP that he did win. It should have gone to Mike Schmidt, who had over double the war value of Steve Garvey in that year. Third player up on my list is Dave Concepcion, shortstop for the Cincinnati Reds. He has a lot of support too, mostly because he was part of that big red machine in the mid-70s, and he was a key player at the time. But in reality, his career just doesn't stand up against the Hall of Famers. I think he's got about a 10% chance of getting into the Hall of Fame. In his WA and WAR numbers, you'll see a lot of consistency here in these guys that were overrated at the time. But now that we understand how to evaluate these players better, they just don't hold up. He was a nine-time All-Star, one-time Top 5 MVP guy, two-time Silver Slugger, and two-time World Series champion with the Big Red Machine. And why is he missed? Low career totals. An 88 OPS+. plus. That's like Ozzie Smith level, but without the defense to be able to make up for the lack of offense. And the last guy on my list is Kurt Flood. His case is different because it's so interesting. I say he has about a 10% chance of getting into the Hall of Fame through an error committee, but that 10% chance is tied to his narrative almost entirely. If you look at his WAA and war numbers, he was actually a better player than the last three guys that we've discussed. He was a three-time All-Star and a top five MVP finisher once, seven gold gloves in center field, and a two-time World Series champion for the St. Louis Cardinals. But his narrative is what's important. He was the first player to stand up and fight against the owners of the baseball teams for free agency. And effectively, that barred him from the game of baseball and ended his career at the age of 32. Now, there's a lot more to the story of Kurt Flood, and I'd highly recommend going out and reading the book A Well-Paid Slave if you have time. His life essentially spun out of control after he did leave the game of baseball, but he had a lot of personal problems too that arose at the same time and contributed to his career completely ending. But you gotta question whether any of that would have happened if he had just stayed quiet and continued to play the game where he was told and for how much he was told, but he chose not to. Recently, the era committees honored Marvin Miller with a Hall of Fame plaque. Should we do the same thing with Kurt Flood, who contributed highly to the game before he left, and he contributed to the free agency of all of his fellow baseball players after he left the game? All of these guys' candidacies will be reviewed by the various area committees as time goes by, and I guess we'll see what they come up with. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed my top 10 list, plus a couple more, of the players most likely to get in through the classic era committee someday. I love going through these lists, so please, Put your comments below. Let me know if you agree, disagree, or you think I missed somebody. And of course, like this video, check out my other videos, subscribe to the channel, talk to me about baseball, send me messages. I'd love it. And I want to hear more about what you'd like to hear about too. Until then, have a great day. Keep talking baseball and we'll see you next time.